Tracy Hampster, who is the uh, project lead for the Two Moors uh, Pine Martin uh, project. Uh, and I, I had a sneak preview of what she's going to say because I saw one of her Zoom presentations a, a few weeks ago, and it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, there's lots to learn, lots of interest. Um, so over to you, Tracy. Thank you. Um, yes, Stephen says I'm the project lead for this project and I've been in post since the beginning of this year, so not really that long. Um, it's a project that actually has been building for quite a long time before that, so we sort of moved into a bit more full steam ahead this year. Um, <coughs> so let's just make sure it's worked. So it's the necessary slide. So it is a partnership project, we're in a sort of development phase, which is partly funded by the Fund, but also our partners. So the key partners uh, in the project National Trust, we can trust the two national parks, um, and then we have supporting partners as well. So that's the necessary bits. So as a project, our goal is to really investigate first of all whether bringing pine mountains back into the southwest is uh, a feasible thing to do, um, and if it is, you know, then you know, how do we go about that, and also. The ultimate goal really is to have a self-sustaining population that can potentially spread across the southwest and also potentially link up with other previous projects that I'll talk about in a bit. So um, what are pine martins? I always ask if anyone's actually seen an alive pine martin in the wild. See any of um, whereabouts um, in Scotland? They're quite hard to see even in Scotland where most of them still occur. So, um, it's a European pine mountain <coughs> across sort of mainland Europe and um, fairly wide distribution. It's part of the mustelid family. So, in the UK, we've got a number of mustelids, seven, eight, so states and weasels, badgers, otters. If we um, jumped across the channel, um, the nearest relative that we have within Europe is the same or beach martin. So you can see it's very similar, it's slightly bigger and has a little white bit, slightly different shape here from the pine martin, which is the one on the left. So they can be quite easy sorry, to you speak use. Up, oh, sorry, yes, I was um, being asked whether I needed the mic, but uh, I will, will do that. Um, so they're native to Britain. They are native and they've been around you know, since the last ice age. They are a native species. And their name Pine Martin, um, we sort of wonder how that came about when actually we don't really have native pine forests in a lot of the UK. And potentially it's come from the fact that um, our main populations that left are in Scotland and some of those are associated with the native pine forest, but also in other parts of Europe. But actually, if you look at other names for them, so in sort of other dialects and in Ireland and Wales and things, it usually translates to things like tree cat or tree martins or martin cats. So there's a sort of martin bit and then some association with trees. So the pine is probably just a, um, a local name that's now become more widely used. So they are, they are about the size of a small cat, I think. Um, and if we have a look at what they are, and they're out hopping around the woodland. It's a move, I think, a little bit like a cross between a cat and something else. They've got quite long legs compared to a lot of the other mustelids that are quite low to the ground. So this is kind of, kind of pretty perfect habitat for a pine martin. It's just kind of three-dimensional woodland habitat where there's a lot of structural diversity. So there's lots of places for them to forage on the ground that keep under cover. They've also got trees there, which are their main escape route from predators. Um, and their main predators that we have left in the UK are foxes um, in Scotland, uh, eagles, golden eagles, and sometimes goshawks will take young as well. So um, you know these kind of habitats give them quite a lot of protection from predators. Is that okay for you to hang in the sand? Lovely. And if we um, have a look at what they look like, a bit more closer, this is quite nice. You've got a sort of chocolate colour fur and then a creamy bib. 
Um, I sort of show the bid there because one of the quite cool things about them is they have quite um, identifiable markings. So the patterns on the bid can be used to identify individuals. So if you can get nice a nice photograph like this, I mean, not many people are good at hitting them like this, you can actually ID them, which is, um, which is really useful. And we'll come on to sort of some of the monitoring that we hope to do um, if we get to the release stage. So let me just have a quick think about their habitats. I've mentioned they're strongly associated with woodland. Um, coniferous and broadleaf woodland, they will live in some of the conifer plantations, um, providing that there's enough food for them in there. One of the limiting factors often with that kind of habitat is denning opportunities. So safe denning places for pine martins are generally up trees. They will go into sort of rock, rock piles and other things, but the safe and well sort of thermally insulated are going to be cavities in, in trees. So it needs to have old trees, big trees that have these kind of features um, in them. Um, so that's, yeah, sometimes with the coniferous woodlands, if they're quite young and it's just a lot of pine trees, it's not really a great deal for them. But sometimes when they've been thinned and you've got a bit more understory, they can survive there quite well. The other kind of habitats that are really important associated with woodlands are kind of rough grass and a lot of their prey species will live in those kind of habitats. Um, so we've got glades and rides in woodland, or even grassland sort of um, adjacent to woodland. Those are important, uh, important places. They're quite flexible in, in that sort of way. You know, they'll use um, they'll use those different habitats together, and actually having a good mix, as I say, for many species is what's really valuable. So they are. I mentioned they're up in trees. They're very good climbers, and that long tail that you can see there is really helpful in terms of balancing. They've got sort of semi-retractable claws, and on the front and the underneath their claws, they're kind of almost serrated, which gives them immensely good, good grip when they're <coughs> scooping up the tree. Um, so they're, they're very well adapted for for life in our trees. So they're. <laughs> Primarily solitary species, um, these two kids <laughs> obviously have been playing probably and the only time that they really come together is to mate which happens sort of in the, in the summer and the females have what's called delayed implantation which means the embryo then doesn't start developing until the following springtime um, and that's quite a, a useful tactic if you like. Um, in case resources are uh, you know, stretched over the winter or the female loses condition and then she may not actually um, sort of develop the, the young. But if all goes well, then a couple of kits, usually up to five, but two or three is kind of average, um, at, at all in April, at March, April time. And that's where those kind of, those tree dens are really important. So obviously the female will give birth in something like that, nice big cavity up in a tree with, it, with a nice big old tree, you've got nice sort of thermal insulation, so that's really important when there's sort of young kids um, in there. They're quite slow breeders, so the females won't, well, both of them don't start breeding until they're sort of three years old, so there's a you know, there's a kind of development lag until they're actually mature to, to breed, but, but they can live for quite a long time, so up to 12 years potentially. So they've got that kind of slow burn strategy. They only have one litter of kits a year. They're quite small litters, but they live quite a long time. So, and the they the kits will stay with their mum for, for a fair bit of time as well. Certainly for the rest of that year and potentially over the winter as well. So um, this is always uh, a useful slide to, to dwell on a bit. So. It's very interesting. This is something I've found quite fascinating, actually, as I've learned more about pine martins. There's been a lot of research done on dietary studies right across Europe. Um, and actually, they are, although they're classified as a, a, a carnivorous species, they're very omnivorous, to be honest. Um, they're also very opportunistic. So they will take what's readily available. They'll take what's abundant. They're not going to make a great deal of effort to find something that's actually quite scarce in the landscape. They're quite flexible in terms of the things that they'll eat. Um, 
small mammals, field voles, bank voles, that kind of thing, for a, a good chunk of their diet, and we can also include squirrels in that as well. Um, and they'll take those all year round, although with grey squirrels, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute, there seems to be a bit of a focus around springtime and squirrels are breeding, which is when pine ones and seem to go for them. Um, again, springtime, often with birds, again, take what's most common, they will take eggs from nests, they will take um, birds sitting on nests or anything they can get hold of, really. They're quite lazy, they just eat whatever they come across to be fair. Um, but one of the really interesting things is that um, fruit plays a really huge part of their diet. Um, and across kind of the uh, European countries where they're found, particularly down in the Mediterranean, fruit can be up to 70% of their diet at certain times a year, so it's, it's really huge. So having fruiting trees and shrubs in the woodland and around the woodland where they are is really important. So lots of buildings. <coughs> Rowan, they're very keen on rowan berries. Um, and that um, means that they actually have a really important role in the woodland of seed dispersal. So one of the things I didn't mention actually is that although they're, they're solitary, they have very large territories. Their territories can be between one and ten square kilometres. And actually, uh, there was one recorded in Scotland that was something like over 50 square kilometres. So really huge. They're travelling long distances in the landscape. And that, that territory size really depends on how much food there is and habitat. You know, quality and things as well. So imagine they're kind of eating some of these seeds and then they're dispersing over really wide areas. You can see that they've got a really kind of important uh, role in terms of seed dispersal. And when we think about trying to recover our woodlands, and I'm sure that um, many of you are part of groups looking at tea planting and trying to you know, achieve these big targets that we have, have for woodland cover. Um, having things that also spread seed with those ground cover as well is, is really important um, because we stick trees in, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff that makes the mix of the wind. Um, then also fungi, invertebrates, yeah, anything really that they can find. Uh, and this means they're quite flexible, so they can be very adaptive in terms of what's, what's about. Um, and if we think about their sort of ecological role in, <coughs> in the woodland, Seed dispersal um, is very important. They, um, and I'll talk about this in a minute. So pressure on non-native species, and this is particularly grey squirrels, um, which is something that's quite interesting that's going on. And also predation as well, which is a really important um, ecological function within any ecosystem. And it's something people get a little bit worried about when you, when you say, oh, we're, we're thinking about reintroducing a predator that's not been in our landscape for 150 years. People get a little bit, bit worried about that. But actually, it's absolutely kind of key. Um, it's a key role. We have a lot of different predators at all different sort of levels in the food chain and food webs. Um, but a lot of the larger ones and some of these sort of mid-sized ones that have been cleared out through habitat loss but most of persecution. You know, we've got rid of a lot of our um, birds of prey that we used to have and certainly a lot of these kind of mid-sized predators like pine martins and wildcats as well. Um, and um, this has left us with kind of few predators that will, you know, predators have their things that they target or that they like to eat. And so we kind of have this quite imbalanced sort of system. So I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Can I just, uh, are you taking questions as you're speaking or do you want questions uh, at the end? Probably at the end, but if you... I just want to think your girl the competition. What you yeah, so I will. So this is a bit of a... So this was a, a, a review um, that someone did looking at the predator interactions. Um, so these are predators of uh, ground nesting grass and woodland in Europe. So obviously we've got species here that we don't have here. And also the lynx um, and um, eagle owls and things. So it's a bit of a complicated diagram, but all it really, all I want to sort of show is the fact that these are all predators apart from the the nominal grass in the middle there, but there's a lot of interactions and a lot of pressures. So that intergill thing means just basically interactions and pressures that happen between and among predators. 
So the arrows are sort of where you've got kind of some pressure. So a fox will predate the pine martin, so you've got that pine martin there. And you can actually see how well the pine martins are sort of connected in. You've got a lot of bird predators here. And we have to remember all the things like all the birds of prey, but all the um, things like corvids as well, which are significant predators. Um, include small mustelids and things as well. And the direction of um, the arrow is the pressure, and often it's two way. So foxes will kill pine martins. They tend to be more of a competition rather than a predation thing. We think they don't tend to eat them that much, but if they're after the same food sources, and obviously a fox is much bigger than a pine martin, but pine martins have also been known to take fox cubs as well, probably the same kind of scenarios. So you've got these kind of pressures and what they do is they kind of balance those predators out because each predator is going to be slightly different in terms of the kind of things that it eats um, and the roles. And what it does is it prevents um, kind of too much targeting of certain prey species. So you've got a sort of um, this kind of spreading of pressure and people worry that bringing another predator in it seems to be they imagine it as this sort of mountain of predators eating everything else and of course that's really not what happens at all so actually having the diversity of both predators and prey and everything else is what makes an ecological system much more resilient especially when it's faced with you know strong environmental changes as we are facing at the moment so having more species that have more connections and more interactions is a stronger, more sort of resilient um, system. So I apologise if that doesn't make sense too much, but it's just trying to um, show that these things all interact with each other. And it's definitely not a sort of top-down kind of directional flow of um, predation, really. So we could start seeing this kind of thing a little bit more if we get more that used to be here. So it wouldn't be a pine martin talk without mentioning pine martins and grey squirrels. Um, is anyone sort of aware of the relationship between pine martins and reds and greys? Because it's had quite a lot among the sort of conservation community, it's had quite a lot of um, publicity really. Um, so I'm sure you all know what squirrels do to trees. Um, the population of the grey squirrels that we have, if you just think about our area in the southwest are huge um, and when we've got all these targets to try and bring back woodland cover we're going to really sort of struggle in terms of achieving um, achieving that with the with grey squirrel populations that we have they just trees get to a certain size and then you know serious damage starts happening um, and the other thing that we have seen um, perhaps some of the more senior members of the um, room might remember when we actually had red squirrels more widespread across across Britain, but we've seen a really very rapid decline of red squirrels as grey squirrels have uh, spread. So they will outcompete them, but they also, as you probably know, carry um, diseases that red squirrels are very susceptible to. And we've now literally um, our main populations of red squirrels across the whole of sort of Great Britain and British Isles, I guess, is, is sort of in our parts of Ireland as a whole and then in Scotland to do other little pockets. So in these parts, I've been seeing a wild red squirrel for a very long time. Um, so there's a great deal of interest in the relationships between these. So in Ireland, um, they're so going back. Back a little way, um, it's not really that long, I think. Actually, I think this is quite interesting because it's actually been quite rapid in terms of sort of ecological changes. But um, pine martins were starting to recover, so <coughs> that's why they disappeared in a minute. Um, but as they started to come back for several reasons, there was a lot of anecdotal observations about grey squirrels disappearing and complete population crashes in certain places. And, and then on the back of this, people were starting to see red squirrels where they hadn't seen them for a very long time before. Um, so not kind of, obviously you can't put a graph and say you've got a causal effect uh, without a bit of research. So uh, already a lot of research has gone into looking at what was that relationship, what was happening, are pine mites predating on grey squirrels or are, are there other mechanisms in place? 
and also um, research is still ongoing in Scotland looking at this. And it seems that it's a bit of a two-pronged thing, so they're definitely uh, predating grey squirrels, and as I mentioned, they seem to target them at their breeding time, which means that they punch above their weight in terms of um, controlling those, red, uh, those grey squirrel populations. I mean, if you've got one pine martin living in a huge territory and you've got thousands of grey squirrels, there's a limit as to how much impact they're going to make. But they, 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 this is sort of targeted kind of timing of when they'll take the whole litter out and things. But the other thing they do is they create this kind of landscape of fear, which really stresses the greys out. They're not co-evolved with pine martins, so they don't have natural and predator strategies to deal with pine martins being <coughs> in their landscape. Um, and so the stress means that their breeding suppressed, they're not feeding and surviving quite as well. So it's a whole sort of range of uh, things, and they did lots of um, experiments looking at reactions of red and grey squirrels to pine martin scents. Red squirrels are out of there as soon as they smell pine martin, they go on, but the grey squirrels are just like, oh, I don't know what to do, and they're just uh, frozen. And they also forage on the ground a lot more as well, which is where pine martins tend to forage. There's quite a bit of crossover in terms of that use of the space. So, um, very interesting um, and quite exciting because a lot of people are very concerned about the number of grades you have. So we've definitely seen these benefits, um, but it's only sort of part of that. <coughs> so we have to tend that a little bit with a bit of a reality check because foresters get very excited thinking that, that all their grade schools are going to be gone as soon as time aren't in So yes, um, so yeah, be a bit cautious there. So just a, a quick uh, chop through their history in Britain. So this is obviously quite late on, really, sort of late 1800s. And the, the yellow there is where they're already rare, and the green are where they're sort of more common, pine martins. And if we pop forward not really that long after that, we can see that actually by that time they've disappeared from most of the main of Britain, and we've really just got these little residual kits left. Um, so one of the main drivers initially was loss of woodland habitat, which would have been ongoing and a long time ago. But actually, um, the sort of ramping up and the speed at which they've disappeared um, has a lot to do with vermin control and, and also the prior to that hunting for fur as well. Um, so if we have a look at where we are kind of now. So, um, so this is 2020, so you can see that yellow blob at the top, that was sort of 2010. Um, and even in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years or whatever, you can see quite a big, um, a big recovery kind of in Scotland. These ones here are reintroductions. So there's the Welsh um, project, which you might be aware of, and there's also been a Forest of Dean reintroduction project as well. And those have both happened since 2016, Forest of Dean 2019. <coughs> there's also a bit of a random one down in the New Forest, which uh, apparently, um, when they did the genetics, they have a Czech origin. So we assume they're escaping from a captive collection somewhere. Uh, but they seem to be doing quite well. <laughs> So um, we've, we've seen quite a healthy sort of recovery, and unfortunately we haven't got the rest of Ireland, but that's a sort of similar picture that was happening across the sort of island of Ireland as a, as a whole. Um, and while that's quite heartening, if we still look at the population numbers, they're still really, really low. The last one, you know, three and a half thousand ish, and most of those are in Scotland most of the majority of those in North Scotland. So although we're seeing a recovery, it's still, you know, in a pretty dire sort of state. And certainly in England and Wales, it's classed as critically endangered. So, um, yeah, so what, what happened? So as mentioned, we've seen that sort of decline in habitat, um, but primarily, um, yeah, I think that, that sort of big decline in habitat is this is uh, yeah, I think with river values. Um, so if we think about seven thousand years ago when pine martins were really, really common, obviously the biggest difference is we've lost a huge amount of our woodland cover. Um, but the sort of real 
real loss came a little bit later. Have a look at that kind of woodland cover trajectory. Uh, that's nationally, but Devon and most counties <coughs> follow a similar one. But we can see that what's happened recently is that we've had quite a big upturn um, in the last 20 years or so due to um, you know, a, a sort of development of, um, of, of woodland, really, planting of woodland. And since the First World War as well, when there was uh, a big push to kind of be a bit more self-reliant uh, on our own kind of production as well. So we've seen a tip up and that, that sort of echoes what's happening in, in Devon. But the other thing in Devon as well, just to remember, is that although we've lost a lot of our woodland, we've kind of regained a little bit, we're still at something about 11 or 12 percent cover or something. Um, but we do what we do have is our amazing hedgerow networks. So they're not always in the best shape that they could be, but we've certainly not lost the volume and, and hedgerow networks that we've seen you know, in other parts of the country. And these are really important connected habitats for <coughs> woodlands and copses that provide those corridors for, for wildlife. So it's sort of a little bit about woodland. Um, so anyway, going back to the sort of declines of these, those, they're very prized for their fur, so they're part of the same family, includes sable and other things. Apparently, the Scottish ones, particularly at certain times of year, as it's colder, had really thick fur, so it was uh, a big export actually at, at one time. Um, the other, the other thing that had were the um, sort of vermin control and the prices put on all ridiculous numbers of species um, to to sort of capture and present to get paid at a certain amount for bringing a tail of a pine martin or, a, or whatever it might have been. So there were bounties paid on a whole range of species and it, although that's, I mean, it's obviously a very bad thing that happened, but because they were paid, a lot of these were kept as parish records and it's actually can be quite um, a useful little snippet of looking back at historical records of what species were around at that time and that's how we know um, that they, you know, that they were widespread, and, and what, where, what that distribution looked like, you know, back in time before we were as good as keeping records as we are now. Um, so there was, yeah, hun hunting and shopping and all sorts of things. But the other thing that really ramped it up was um, the kind of sporting estates that really kind of took off with Victorian and post, you know, post that kind of time. And there was wholesale removal of any predator that was going to, you know, get in the way of that at all. Um, so that really kind of, that's when they really nailed a lot of things like the birds of prey, pine martins, wildcats and all the rest of them. Um, but, um, yeah, so that's a, another big driver. Um, and unfortunately, although pine martin is now protected, Trapping still occurs in places in ways that it shouldn't do, and it certainly still happens in Scotland. Um, and sometimes pine martins are illegally targeted, and sometimes they're just accidentally caught as well. So it's it's still ongoing, and it's a big issue for us as a to manage a project, bringing them back to somewhere where they've obviously historically been persecuted. And we have to be able to demonstrate that that. It's not going to happen down here. Nature stop when begin as any of their pipelines if they think that's going to happen. So, um, yes, it's quite a challenge. So we've seen that recovery, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, one is the legal protections that have been put in place. So, you know, an example is the Wildlife and Countryside Act. There's been other legislation in Scotland as well. So once they gained legal protection and it became illegal to trap and shoot and do all the other lovely things that people seem to want to do to them, um, they, they did start to recover. But also the sort of reforestation of a lot of parts of Scotland and not Ireland actually, Ireland's quite interesting because it doesn't have a lot of trees and there's still seeing recovery. Um, but also changing practices, particularly more recently, of planting more broadleaf woodland as well. And I've just put a really nice landscape picture for from the trees of wildfire to South Island, 
huge fact sheets, I just think it's wonderful, and it's a really great example of a project where they've just really gone for it to try and re-wood their landscape. So where was um, that? Trees for Life is up in the um, west, uh, sorry, east, north, east Scotland area. I can't remember exactly what the, the region is. If you Google it, um, we've got a great website and there's a lot about their project there. They've been planting trees there for a long time and it's really starting to change the landscape significantly. Um, and those reintroductions that I mentioned, so they're providing <coughs> stones for pine mountains um, in areas where, where they have been eradicated before. So, um, we've seen that recolonisation. Why do we want to reintroduce pine martins per se? So, sort of mentioned the kind of benefits that they bring. Um, but one of the key things as well is that it's not just about them wildlife trust and our partners thinking, oh, that would be cool, but actually it's part of a national strategic plan that was commissioned by Nature Scotland and Natural England that took by its wildlife trust, who are our sort of masculine experts. Um, and after looking at um, um, translocations or reintroductions into Wales, the South West was highlighted as the next most suitable place. So they did lots of habitat modelling and all sorts of things just to look at where, if you're going to do a reintroduction, where is the best place to do that? And they did some modelling. So this was looking at 25 years into the future without any, con without any reintroductions. We're still stuck really with that barrier um, up in the um, sort of northern Northern England, where you've got big conurbations, road systems, and all sorts of things. Um, but if then they modelled in the Welsh and Forest of Dean one, and also a, a reintroduction down here, you can see it's that you know create kind of a meta population that potentially can can link up within that time frame. Um, so they're not going to get here on their own. Basically, it's going to have to be some sort of intervention that brings back. So that brings us to where we're at with our project. Um, so how does one bring back a carnivore? It's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things we have to consider. And one of the first things that we looked at was getting an initial feasibility study done to see whether we've got enough habitat. Is it, is it actually even possible you know, to bring them back? Um, and, and have we got enough of the right sort of habitat? And is it connected? And a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so we're kind of working through a process um, that was laid down initially by the IUCN as global guidelines for reintroductions. Um, since that was the last version of that in 2013, we've now got Scottish and DEFRA to produce an English version of that with our own uh, legal kind of constraints and case studies and things. Um, which gives us a whole bunch of things that we have to think about and it's kind of the gold standard for any sort of reintroduction. Um, and this is just the first, first kind of step. Um, there's a couple of things within those guidelines that are really important. So animal welfare is really important, but also the socio-economic elements of this. So part of our project, um, we have been talking to people key stakeholders, landowners, sheep communities, farmers, all sorts of people for the last, well, we're probably getting on for a couple of years now, but this year we've been doing a lot of more intense stakeholder workshops and we also um, commissioned a social feasibility study um, that was done by the University of Exeter and that was independent of us, so it's very important that we had someone else kind of have that independent study and they did a wide-ranging public survey, so anyone in the southwest was able to take part in that. I don't know any of you did here, but also they did some very in-depth interviews with some of our stakeholder um, stakeholders to really get under the skin of exactly what they felt about having pine martins back in the landscape. So the public survey was overwhelmingly positive, but of course it's only as good as you know. We've had over 800 people reply, but that's quite good. That's quite a big uh, response for survey. But when you think about our population, we have to sort of have that caveat. But you know, it's just those those people that took part. The stakeholders had sort of three perspectives. There was one sort of group that were very supportive. 
They felt that we have an obligation to bring back lost species um, and were very positive about that. There was a sort of second view that was generally supported, but with caveats, they felt actually, okay, well, we need to be making sure that it's not having impacts on some of our rare species or on, the, on poultry or um, game birds, for which I might have a, a tendency to like to munch on occasion. And then the third one were quite opposed, and most of that group were made up of, of people like gamekeepers and some land farmers and land managers. So it's really given us quite a strong direction in terms of how we carry on communication with, with all these groups. Um, and whatever happens with the project, we get our consent at the moment, we've, we've put in our feasibility study and we're waiting to hear from Natural England. We should hear back before Christmas whether we can go forward with the reintroductions. Um, but part of that, they will want to see that we are engaging with these groups and that we have kind of a communication plan and, and ways of dealing with problems that come up. So if that's my job at the moment, it's uh, mitigation plans that we're doing. Um, and part of that is, is trying to give some of these people with concerns access to other people in other parts of the country that do live with pine martins. What's the reality? Where are the problems? How often does it happen? And what do you do? Um, we found it quite hard to find people to come and talk, talk about this because most people didn't really have problems. <coughs> Good, but quite hard for us. Um, so anyway, we, we've done a couple now. Um, so we had a forestry focused one, and we've also had one where we were looking at kind of experiences in Wales and Scotland as well. So um, going some way towards that, we've got a whole raft of other stuff. So very quickly, so from our kind of work so far, these are our main potential release regions. So we've got Exmoor and Dark Wharves. So this is. Um, nine, ten kilometre squares that have on average got about 20% woodland cover, so there are kind of big wooden areas. Um, we are considering this as one reintroduction project, but if we get our consent, we'll be doing one and the other in so consecutive years. So if all goes to plan, we would put animals out this time next year, and then the following year we would go to the, the other region. You've got the quantops there as well. Yes. Which are, yeah, that, that's heavily wooded, but um, there's a barrier between the Quantops and Exmoor. Yes, yes. As such, so how so, is that going to work? In the so, some, I mean, and the idea also is that eventually these populations will merge and there are barriers between, like some of the road systems and things. Roads are quite a big, high risk thing for pine mountains. So part of the modelling was looking at places where there's enough habitat and things, but also away from too many big roads and urban sort of areas. And what one of the things we're looking at is looking at where there are gaps. So looking at ecological networks, we've done quite a lot of that at DWT with other projects. So overlaying some of that on here and seeing where our target areas are going to be in terms of habitat restoration and sort of things like tree planting. Um, and so Somerset here, so that, yeah, you're right, that's going to be, you know, what are the sort of target areas, I think, around there to, to look at whether we can connect that. There's quite reasonable connectivity across here and down through here, and then if eventually they get over here, we've got some quite big woodland blocks um, in that area as well. So, um, yes, lots of things to, lots of things to think about. Um, so what have we been doing? So drilling down from those, those <coughs> dogs, if you like, those woodlands, we've had volunteers out with an app doing um, habitat surveys, so they're looking for key habitat features like the cavities in trees, fruiting trees and shrubs, how big are trees, all sorts of things, um, and we're just sort of looking at the analysis of, of that right now, um, and then coming up um, next month we're doing some sort of prey availability, so some quite standardised methods that they use in Scotland to do year on year to look at kind of vulnerable populations and things to make sure basically there's going to be enough when they get here. Um, so other things we do need to think about are mitigation um, around some vulnerable things. So we, as part of this process, we've had to do essentially a massive ecological impact assessment. So it's the habitat regulations assessment. 
um, which people have to, if you do developments and things, it's normally, you know, you've got a protected area and you have to do an assessment. But we had um, six special areas of conservation, which are quite big, and 21 triple SIs in those, those regions to look at, so it was quite massive. Um, and we contracted out specialist areas, so like bats and things, where we needed that specialist uh, input to assess that risk to those species. Um, overall, very simplified, the key areas of risk are generally where you've got these sort of man-made structures, so things like buildings and um, you know, buildings where things roost, but also things like nest boxes, where there's sort of recognition, especially predators, and I know this from doing dormice surveys, we get these all sort of recognised kind of old nest boxes, we know it's in there, <laughs> and they'll go through and take the whole, whole lot out. So it's a bit of work around being able to, to uh, put protections on these, which is fairly standard in North America and mainland Europe, where there are these more, more predatory species. Um, so a lot of it's just about trialling some of them, putting them in place in strategic areas, um, and with, with um, bats. So we've obviously got some really key bat roosts in the southwest. Um, putting in tip trays, anti-crime elements and things. So these are all tried and tested methods, but these are things that if we get our consent, we'll be getting this stuff for the of January winters. Um, so just, um, yeah, so this is the other thing. Our main risks are, in terms of socioeconomic, it's really game birds, pumps. So when they're penned, when they bring all the pheasants in, and they're small, and they're in a pen, you know, it needs to be got a nice food source for foxes, polecats, and pine martins, um, and the poultry as well. Generally speaking, if it's quite well protected against foxes, it's generally okay for pine martins, but pine martins are smaller and they can climb, so those are kind of considerations. So we're looking into some more bespoke kind of protection, especially for smaller smaller units, but again, VWT have produced huge amounts of um, guidance. So I've just got a few slides just to sort of show you what a reintroduction looks like. What do we do? Um, so we've also had to do a full disease risk analysis. So we have to look at that whole pathway of bringing animals down from Scotland to where we're going to release them um, and assessing what that risk is in terms of risk of disease to the martins or um, to anything else really. So it's another hoop that we have to jump through. Um, and a whole bunch of stuff up in Scotland, which will kick off in the new year if all goes to plan. So lots of surveys up there. We're only allowed to go above the orange line. That's the grey squirrel demarcation line. We're not allowed to take pine martins out where there are greys and pine martins for obvious reasons, but also it's still a recovering population further south. Um, we have to talk to people in Scotland. We don't want to take their little pine martin that comes to their feeder every day in their garden that's got a name and they're attached to. So we don't want to be taking it on a one-way holiday to Devon. Um, so it's a bit of engaging the local communities um, in Scotland as well. So it's, a, it's a, probably been some wildlife trust will be quite a lot of that work for us. So so this is the Forest of Dean project, just to give you a bit of an idea of what we do. So the pine martins come down again to what we call a soft release pen. So we build temporary pens in the woodland. Um, and they, they go into those, it's like a den box, food, water and everything, and they get monitored for about three days and, and fed. Um, and the research that's done, been done before has shown that that's how long it takes for their cortisol or their stress hormones to go back down to normal. So they've obviously got to come quite a long way and we want to make sure that you know, not stressed and then we open the door. And generally they don't come back. Some of them, there was one with Miss Piggy apparently kept popping back to be fed a bit more. <laughs> so generally they, they're gone at that point. And they'll all have radio tracking collars on. So I think one of the previous slides is on with the collar. So we'll be tracking them. Um, and then the tracking collars fall off after a while. So then we'll be doing kind of wide scale camera trapping and scat surveys and all sorts of things to understand the dispersal of them and you know, breeding success and you know, all those kind of success measures for an account project. So that's someone doing the scat survey. Forest Dean and camera trapping. Um, yeah, and so 
we just, in fact, that's the other, the other thing they do at the moment, our monitoring plan, which is quite huge and quite intense. So we've got, fortunately, some really good input from researchers from Scotland and Wales as well to make sure that what data we're collecting is going to be really robust, that we carry it out in a way that's comparable with data being collected elsewhere. And there's lots of modelling going on, looking at how we introduce populations, kind of spread in the landscape, and what kind of things limit that, and kind of sort of things help that. Um, so, you know, we, we've got got lots of stuff to do. Um, so another big part, which I'll just fin finish on, is um, the project. We're heading towards applying for lottery funding for the main delivery phase, um, all goes to plan. Um, and there's a big swathe of community, uh, big community element to that. So we have um, a community consultation going on in some of the sort of hub communities within those within those regions. So there's like Porlock and Minehead and things up in Exmoor, and then we've got places like Belgrasby and um, Belly Trace and things down around Darkwall. So um, it's, a, it's a bit of a sort of a community assessment see what people feel about five mountains coming back um, and making people aware of what it actually means in reality we have found that there's some very weird and inflated ideas that people have about what pine mountains do and what they do so um, anyway so i shall stop there oh, i think put my email on there i have to take that off for future presentations but yes do contact me if you want to know any more and if anyone's got any questions, I can look at the time.